very excited to welcome Noor Ekle Ek I'm sorry for the Ek El okay. Hatabi Strauk. Is that the correct point? Yes, you got it. Is that it? Thank you. Uh, and he is a community organizer and facilitator from Casablanca, Morocco, currently living in Western Massachusetts. Nor is starting a new adventure as executive director of YES and hopes to continue growing the impact of this organization that works with social change makers at the meeting point of internal, interpersonal, and systemic change to co-create thriving, just, and balanced ways of life for all. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Noor. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I've been really excited about this session uh, for quite a while now. Uh, as Dan said, I am Noor El Khattabi Strauk. Uh, I live in Massachusetts, but I am currently in Casablanca, Morocco. I've been visiting my family here for, for Eid. Uh, and usually my voice does not sound like this, but I was at a very exciting football match last night and was doing a lot of cheering very loudly and we won so it was worth it um so um uh, very happy to be here i wanted to um use this session to introduce a few of the tools and frameworks we use at yes yes stands for youth for environmental sanity we go by yes so yes world uh we are a international organization that we organize programs in different parts of the world and many programs in north america we also have programs in different parts of the Middle East, including Turkey, Egypt, Morocco, and we have programs in South Asia, in Pakistan, and in India. Our programs are called GEMS. Dan is sharing uh, our link for our website where you'll find uh, a, lot, a lot more information about us. Our flagship program is called the GEM or Leadership GEMS, which are gatherings of four to seven days um, where we bring in change makers uh, from different walks of life, from different uh, ways of acti activism, uh, artists, healers, community organizers. Uh, we worked mostly with the younger folks for most of Yes's existence, but now moving towards working with multi generational le leaders uh, in, dif in different forms, knowing how important it is to, to bring in different people from different walks of life. Um, and so today I wanted to take this chance to introduce a few of the most important tools and frameworks that we introduce at GEMS and that uh, have been helpful to lots and lots of change makers throughout the, throughout the world. My entry point into YES was as a participant in the Middle East Youth Leadership Jam in 2012, 11 years ago, uh, while I was deputy director of a community center here in Casablanca working with uh, at-risk youth and children uh, from some of the poorer areas. And the jam was so helpful to me in uh, helping me find ways to slow down, to understand more about my process, what's happening to me, uh, to be aware of burnout and what happens to a lot of uh, activists and people in the field and to find support when I need it. And so i um, excited to share some more of that today. Uh, but before we get that, uh, one of our most important tools that we've been practicing, especially uh, in these times of virtual connection, but really at all times, uh, that I want to start with before we get to sharing screens or anything, is just, just take a moment to ground and land into this call. Uh, I know it's seen in the chat, it's beautiful that folks are connecting from so many parts of the world, lots of different time zones, lots of different um, days that we have to live in. So I just wanted to take a moment for us all to land here together, do a bit of a grounding or a stretch, so I want to invite you, if you feel comfortable, to close your eyes or soften your gaze, uh, put your feet on the ground, and we'll just do a few breaths together uh, and invite some stretch in the body in whichever way feels, feels good and helpful uh, to land. So I'd like to invite you to breathe in through your nose, and then when we breathe out, we'll do it through the mouth, and we'll just try to do a few slow ones. <sighs> For our next breath, you can let it out with a sound or a sigh. Oh. 
And then with this last breath, I just want you to feel into your body what needs some touch or some love and just stretch that part of your body. Oh. oh, yeah, I know for me, it's been my back just sitting in front of the computer for a few hours now. But please feel into whatever part of you needs some more love and continue to extend that throughout, throughout the session. Um, so then if we could share the screen so we could get to our first um, slide. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, as I said, I am here representing the organization, which is yes, of which I've been the executive director for um, very briefly for the past uh, seven months or so, taking over from um, my dear friend and mentor Shilpa Jain, who was steward in this organization for about eleven years. Um, this first slide, I just wanted to share basically the ethos or the idea of what we really try to work on is. Uh, this idea of the fields of transformation and where we want it to work is at the meeting point of personal, interpersonal, and systemic transformation. Uh, we insist on this because throughout the lifetime of YES, we've learned that so much effort goes into um, systemic change, which is very important. But the systems, in order for the systems to change, the folks working on them need to be sustained and need to be supported. And we've learned that when we ignore and don't pay attention to the personal and interpersonal needs of change makers on the ground, the systemic impact tends to be uh, much smaller and, um, and evaporates in ways that are not sustainable. And so that's what we try to do at GEMS is to focus on that systemic impact, but bring in a lot of the personal, interpersonal transformation pieces and allow folks the time and the space to really look within and find what is sustaining for them within the work that they're doing. And if it's not sustaining, what can be done um, for, for that work to, to feel good uh, for them and not just uh, the feeling of responsibility and the burden of changing the world and not sustaining ourselves. Um, and uh, to do this, we, we provide a number of different tools throughout the jam, uh, and I'm going to provide a few different ones. Then if we can go to the next slide. Um, we, one thing that we start with is what we call building a container. And this is uh, one way where we bring a lot of intentionality into uh, the group work that we do. Every time we come together, we like to be aware of what each of us are and in a space where we're honoring the different needs. Um, and so one of our first things that we do is group agreements. And this is something that is that I found to be incredibly helpful, not just at GEMS, but taking it on into my professional life and the different jobs that I've held, uh, into my relationships, into my family. Um, and this is an example of agreements that we offer for virtual <laughs> connection, virtual calls. Uh, that I'm going to share a little bit about. Um, one thing is uh, one person speaking at a time. This just helps us minimize interruptions, minimize misunderstandings, and give people the space to fully share what they're sharing before we start interpreting or, or coming to a conclusion about what they're sharing. Uh, we invite folks to share from I language. Uh, this means sharing uh, from your own experience. We call it speaking from the I. Um, this means that if I'm living through an experience and I'm able to share it from the I pronoun, I am holding to it a, a lot more and I'm claiming my experience a lot more. And that brings awareness to what I'm uh, to how I want to move forward with it. Confidentiality is an important uh, agreement that we provide uh, similarly for for this call and for a lot of calls that we have as we ask people to be vulnerable, to be honest, to to share masks, to hop into the stretch zone, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. Confidentiality is really important. Uh, honoring yourself and others. Uh, we know sometimes needs clash. Uh, and we um, invite the fact that we're not all going to be in the same space. Uh, for this call as well, if you feel at some point that you want to turn your camera on, be interactive, 
And that's what's helping you be present here. But please feel free to do so. If it's more helpful to be off camera or if you need to go to the bathroom, please honor your own needs. And finally, deep listening and practicing um, a really, really deep listening, which is sometimes can be really hard, especially when somebody is speaking and, you know, I start to get already ideas about how I want to respond and I'm developing my argument. And one of our deep practices is to really slow down into the speaking and um, to wait to think until after I have processed and heard what the person is actually saying. We also bring in reflections uh, uh, and really slowing down in those moments. This also bleeds in a little bit into the three eyes. Um, the three eyes are invitation language, intentions, and eye language. I already spoke about eye language. Uh, invitation language um, is a way for us to bring in choice into uh, all of our interactions um, uh, during the jam, during our programs. Um, everything is really optional. We invite people to participate in the activities to uh, take the steps that we the the to take the steps within the program uh, with full choice and full intentionality, which is sometimes something that we found really lacking uh, when people are just doing something because of the group or because of a group pressure, and when we explicitly frame it as an invitation, and everything that you do comes from your choice, then that really shapes the experience of folks in our programs and in everyday life. Um, and then thirdly, intentions, uh, which is something we do at the first day um, to just slow down and think about why am I here and what do I want to do? Um, uh, and uh, it's actually something that I wanted to practice here today with, with all of you. Uh, and so, Dan, if you go to the next uh, slide, I am going to be pasting the link here for that Jamboard. I've, if you could click on it, and uh, you will go to that page. You'll see that I've pasted two of my intentions, which are for this session, me intending to share what's helped me in my journey, some of the work, and also my intention to ask for and be receptive to all feedback uh, with love and with honoring the, exp the different experiences in the room. Um, and so I wanted to extend this invitation uh, now for you, if you'd like to um share uh, a couple of intentions um if everybody uh could share one or two intentions for uh what they want through this session through this program the way you do it is you go right here where there is a sticky note underneath the big arrow and once you click on it a sticky note appears and then you write a message and then you move it into the center of the room and so I see that folks are already on it. If we could just take a couple of minutes and you want to write an intention for the session or intention for your, the month ahead for you. Um, and as we do this, as we do that, I would want to, to, to mention something about intentions that for us, intentions are very different from uh, expectations. This is the big, the big distinction. Intentions are about um what i want to to be doing and what i intend for myself bring in it's uh, intentions are much more empowering a lot of times expectations if i'm going to a session an online thing a program i i can might be having expectations for what the people are going to do or what the program is going to look like and expectations feel more out of my hand uh, whereas intentions um, as I see these beautiful intentions here, I intend to engage in these spaces with reciprocity. Uh, it's really something more about what I can do, what I want to hold for myself, and how I want to move fully into the space. Um, and so claiming that intentionality and that choice is a really essential step into shaping our own experiences. This has, for us, been incredibly empowering throughout the programs and outside of our programs when folks go back into their work, their relationships, their families, and bring in the power of intention uh, instead, of, instead of expectation. Uh, it can really shape uh, how, what I want to put into something and what I want to get out of it. So we'll just take another maybe few seconds or minute here as folks are renting intentions. 
Uh, and I just want to um, bring up a few here that look really cool to me, stretch my mind and learn something new, uh, intend to be in flow more often, uh, intend to be present uh, to deepen my awareness, um, I intend to learn skills of how to be a better facilitator for transformative learning environments. That's beautiful. I intend to turn my camera on and finish my <laughs> once I finish my cereal. I love that. Uh, and intend to hold joy and lightness throughout the session. Thank you all so much for sharing some of these intentions. Um, and what's really cool is that if you wrote one intention, but now together we have collective intentions that we can look around, this slide will still be here, and we can hold these together uh, for each other throughout the session and maybe even after. So moving on to uh, the zones of awareness or learning, um, this is what the session was named after. Um, this is our most memorable tool, the thing that folks remember the most about our programs. Um, I wanna take a moment also here to mention that uh, these jams that I've mentioned happen in different countries. Um, we've had, uh, there's been almost 200 of them uh, organized now across the world, and many in North America, many in the Middle East and South Asia, as I, as I said, uh, with almost 4,000 participants from more than 80 countries. And more of them are happening in, in different languages and in different cultures. Um, and the zones of awareness is really one of the things that sticks the most with people because it is a tool that has helped me, has helped a lot of folks bring in more um, slowness and more knowledge about what happens to us in everyday life. And so to share about it briefly, the zones of awareness are, um, or some, people, some folks call them the zones of being, um, is really what happens to me and where I am in relation to different things around me and in relation to, uh, to what is happening. Um, and as you see, there's three zones, um, the comfort zone, the stretch zone, and the panic zone. The comfort zone is when I am in some, somewhere that's really familiar, something that's easy, um, something that I don't spend a lot of time thinking about, it's just automatic. Um, a comfort zone could be um, really, comf really comfortable, obviously, really easy to be in, but it doesn't invite a lot of learning. It is good for a lot of resting, but there's not much learning happening in the, in the comfort zone. Um, the stretch zone is where I'm not, very, I'm not actually comfortable, but I am present and I'm aware of what's happening around me, and that's where the learning happens. The stretch zone is when there's something um, that I'm not really 100% sure about, but I know that I can in engage with. And this is really about engagement. When I am present in the moment, when I'm able to observe and notice what's happening for me inside my own head, inside my body, and what is happening around me, I can not only make more logical conclusions, um, but also ask for information that I don't have uh, and listen to that information and process it in ways that are going to be helpful to me and to others in the next steps that I'm going to take. So the stretch zone, as we say, is the where the magic happens, is where transformation happens. Um, outside of the stretch zone is the panic zone. And the panic zone is when I am beyond my capacity. Uh, I've gotten to a point where I'm not really able to be receptive or engaged with folks. Um, there's a lot of things that happen in the panic zone. We call it the panic zone. It doesn't 100% correspond to the word of that we can think of sometimes of panic, just a big, big, loud uh, panic. Sometimes the panic zone shows up in different ways. Sometimes it shows up as withdrawal. Sometimes it shows up as just me being here, but not really being here. Uh, not really being able to, to think and interact with folks. Uh, often it shows up as uh, the fight response, either attack other or attack self when a situation is arising and conflict comes, comes up um, and I'm in a blaming mode that can be really hard for other people, but also self-blame can be really hard and is um, a really a hallmark of the panic zone is attacking oneself. It can also show up as avoidance. Avoidance is when I find something that feels productive or feels good to do 
uh, but I'm doing it just as an escape. Um, for a lot, uh, uh, sometimes that shows up as addictions. Sometimes that shows up as social media. Sometimes that shows up as things that seem good, like going to the gym, working out, like uh, delving deeply into studies or into work, uh, which in itself is not a bad thing. But when that becomes an escape and um, it takes me away from what I really need to be dealing with, then that becomes a panic zone response of, of avoidance. Um, one important word about these zones is that, first of all, they are dynamic and not static. Um, my comfort zone today could be different than my comfort zone tomorrow, could be different in the afternoon, depends on a lot of different factors. For example, if, um, if I am hungry and not in a good space and have a headache, um, I could be more easily put into my panic zone than if I am feeling really good and really present and have had an important conversation and feel accomplished. Um, the other thing about the zones is that they're really different from one person to the other. Um, what's in one person's panic zone can be in another person's comfort zone. Yeah. Uh, example for this um, can be, for example, public speaking. For some folks, that's really something familiar and they've done it all their lives. Um, might be a little bit stretchy, but it could feel comfortable. Uh, for others, just the notion of speaking publicly in front of, you know, 10 plus people uh, can put them in their panic zone. Same thing for example, dancing. I know that for a lot of folks, dancing is the most natural thing in the world and they just let their body move. Uh, for me, for some other people, dancing in front of others can be really awkward and uh, could be at the edge of stretch, could be in panic zone. All right. Thank you, everybody. Welcome forward, as we like to say at the jam, because you never truly go back to anything. There's always only going forward. So welcome forward. Um, thank you all for taking a moment to share with, that, with each other a little bit. I want to have deep gratitude for Helia, who I shared the breakout room with. Um, and we had a pretty stretchy conversation and so just uh, wanted to honor you, appreciate that conversation and honor everybody else who was able to uh, stretch about in the conversation about stretching. So for this next part of uh, my presentation, I wanted to, to present um, a couple of the tools that we use um, to foster better connection and better conversation between people. Uh, and this is also one of the learnings that we've had throughout the years is that so much conflict that arises um, is just cracks in the conversation and cracks in understanding. Um, we don't th think of conflict as uh, bad or as negative. We don't think of it as positive either. Conflict is neutral, but conflict is more importantly inevitable. Um, and conflict is always an opportunity uh, to recognize that there is an unmet need uh, and it can lead to either breakthrough or breakdown. Breakdown is when we get into conflict and we're unable to truly listen to each other and there isn't really a way forward. Breakthrough is when we're able to slow down into our conflict and able to um, come to a point of not necessarily agreement, but understanding. Most of the time, understanding leads to agreement, but sometimes even understanding without agreement can be a point of reconciliation um, that uh, that is not we're not able to access if we're uh, not listening to each other. And so we do a lot. We practice a lot of active listening um, in our programs. Um, and one of the tools that we share is listening without GIFing. Uh, G I F J I F J stands for judging, interpreting, and fixing. Um, there's quite a few things that usually happen when I'm not able to listen to somebody, but these three things are the most common. One uh, is judging, is when somebody is, is expressing their experience or opinion or something that's happened to them, and they say one thing, and I latch onto that, and I start judging them, and I go into my own head, and I'm not really able to listen to the rest of what they shared, and I lose the context. And I judge them on one thing that they said. Interpreting is when something is unclear to me, 
but I take it in a certain way and I believe it and I start to build up the story of what that person is saying. Not exactly based on what they said, but based on what I interpreted uh, from something that they shared. And then fixing is when someone is sharing something difficult for them or a problem that they're encountering. Um, and a lot of times people are sharing that not necessarily looking for you to give a solution, but that's such an immediate uh, reaction that can happen for all of us. It's like, oh, I know how to fix this. Or um, somebody sharing a problem like, oh, here's how you actually uh, in, uh, deal with that. And that's not always very helpful because sometimes people just want to be heard. Sometimes people just want to vent. Sometimes people just want to fully tell their story and then ask for help and being interrupted halfway with solutions that are not exactly helpful can be really hard. So we we practice really providing what the person is asking for and judging, interpreting, fixing while listening is um, not something that has been found to be helpful uh, in interacting with folks. Uh, and so an important part of connecting and knowing people more is both listening, but also asking. And we're gonna practice this in a breakout room in a second, but we've talked about listening. I wanna talk a little bit about the asking. Um, so and here in, in the asking, I want to introduce this uh, really powerful tool called Appreciative Inquiry. Um, you might have heard of it from other programs. It's not a GEM exclusive uh, thing, but Appreciative Inquiry um, is uh, really a technique that was uh, developed by these two folks, Dave, David, David Cooperwriter and Diana Whitney, who share that human systems grow towards what they persistently ask questions about. And their idea and the start in this movement is that so many of the questions that we have are about what's broken and how to fix it. And a lot of times that puts us in the mindset of focusing on the brokenness. And it's hard to move out of that and break out of that. Uh, and to offer an alternative is sometimes to ask appreciatively about what you want or about what you want to learn about. So changing the quality of the questions and changing the quality of our listening can change the quality of our relationships. And in this framework, appreciative questions have four major characteristics. Uh, one is substance. This means that the questions are inviting um, like a chunky answer, a full answer. Um, if I ask you a yes or no question, and you're probably gonna give me yes or no, and the conversation will end there. Um, uh, so, but if I ask you an open-ended question, a question that's developed that invited more of an answer, we can engage at a much deeper level. The second one is genuine curiosity. Uh, I'm asking you something because I truly want to know and I truly have curiosity, and not just because it's small talk or I want to pass the time, uh, but finding the things that I have true curiosity about and asking towards those. The third one is integrity. And integrity here means asking questions that I would be willing and ready to answer myself. Uh, and in that way, honoring, honoring the answer as much as the question that if I'm going to ask you something, I could also answer it if you ask me right back. And then the fourth one is positivity. And uh, positivity here doesn't necessarily mean only ask about good things, but bringing positivity in our questions, even when the theme is challenging. Um, and so, for example, I could ask you, like, what's the worst experience of your life? And uh, it's going to be really hard to uh, to engage with that. It doesn't bring in a lot of positivity. We need a lot more container building, a lot more trust to jump into that. But I can frame it in a way that can bring in positivity. And I can ask, what's a difficult experience that you've had and the life lesson that you learned from it? And in that way, you could still share about something difficult, but we're not focusing only about the hardship, but also, also bringing in where the positivity is. And that way we'll be growing towards. Um, so here, for example, can you share about one of the best gifts you ever received or one of the best gifts that you've ever given? Uh, can you tell me about a time you spent with someone older or younger than you from a different generation? How was that meaningful to you? Uh, can you share about a time that you grew in wisdom or in faith or in compassion? And so as you see, um, 
this is a very different way of asking. If you see the, the, the question about um, interacting with people from different generations, I could ask you, do you like to hang out with younger people? And you could be like, nah, they're different. Or um, no, I just like to hang out with people my own age. But finding a way to bring in more of that answer um, was going to lead to a conversation where a lot more learning is going to happen. And the conversation happens in the stretch zone where I can be vulnerable, I can share about my own experience. I'm not just generalizing and, and um, contextualizing. So thank you for taking the time to share a bit about with each other in the breakout rooms. Um, before we conclude, I just wanted to open the space if there's any sharings or reflections or questions from you about um, the different elements of the session, any other curiosity or feedback or any comments that you want to share uh, before we do a little bit of a, of a closing round. Seen a, a, a message in the chat that from Alyssa that met my need for human connection, and I wish we had discussed something that was more in my stretch zone. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Alyssa, definitely. Uh, I wish the, 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 ses the session was much, much longer. This is why we do this for, um, for a week together in a natural environment, but really appreciating your stretch in here. Yeah, thinking, thank you, Roxanne. Uh, Roxanne thinks it's incredibly incredible how little is actually necessary for having beautiful uh, and opening conversations. And I think that's true. Uh, some of the basic human technologies are listening without jiffing uh, or asking appreciative in 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 inquiry for human connection. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for um, sharing a bit more about your experience here. Um, before we close, I just wanted to, I know there's a lot of other exciting sessions coming, coming uh, up. And I, as we landed together with a breath, I'd like to close us out again with a breath and a stretch uh, so that we can reset our nervous system and be ready to move on to uh, the next part of our day. Uh, so once again, I'll just ask you to put your feet on the ground if you can, close your eyes or soften your gaze. Take a few deep breaths uh, in through the nose, out through the mouth, and we'll just do it together for a few breaths, and then we can move out of the room. Oh. Oh, wonderful. So much gratitude for all of you to stick it out here. Have a wonderful rest of your day or have a wonderful night. I see that somebody is connecting from New Zealand. Uh, so please take care and be gentle with yourselves and each other and see you next time.